All right, so I'm back. And today we'll be picking up from where we left off. Uh, in 1.3, of course, we were talking about deductive and inductive arguments and how to tell the difference between the two. So as we move into 1.4 now, we'll be dealing with both types of arguments. But finally, I suppose, uh, we will be now talking about how do we actually evaluate deductive and inductive arguments. That is, in some sense, how do we tell if it's a good deductive argument or a bad one? And the same applies to inductive arguments as well. Uh, and as you can see on this slide, we're going to have a lot of uh, new terminology we'll be dealing with here when we talk about how to evaluate uh, those different kinds of arguments. To begin with, though, I want to begin somewhat <clears throat> more informally by simply seeing if we have some gut reactions to uh, a, a series of arguments here. Um, just what I'm going to want you to do here uh, is think about if a particular argument, would you say it is a good one or a bad one? And so uh, we can begin here with this one. All mammals have hair. Bobo is a mammal. Thus, Bobo has hair. Right? Now, uh, if you're wondering, is this a deductive argument or an inductive argument, uh, that's certainly a good question to ask. Uh, it does not neatly fit into the uh, types of uh, arguments we looked at in 1.3, though it's pretty close to a categorical syllogism. All right? We've got our first uh, premise here, beginning with the word all. And so you know that a categorical syllogism uh, has two premises and a conclusion. And each of the claims in that argument begins with the words all, no, or some. Problem here, not really a problem, but the difference here uh, is that the second premise over there, uh, Bobo is a mammal, doesn't begin with all, no, or some. So it's not officially a categorical syllogism, but it is close. And so, um, in fact, as we will see in a couple slides here, we'll be thinking of these, this one and the rest on this slide uh, in terms of uh, deductive arguments. So the question is, is it a good argument or is it a bad argument? Um, and I think for many people, uh, they are inclined to think that this is a good argument, this first one here. Here's another example. Uh, Ross Perot was elected president, thus Dan Quayle as vice president. Now, you, you might know your American political history here uh, and know about Ross Perot and Dan Quayle. But at any rate, um, I think many people, when they think about this one, um, are inclined to say that this is probably some kind of bad argument um, either because they know that Ross Perot and Dan Quayle didn't run uh, on the same presidential ticket, um, or uh, just realizing that just because one person was elected president, that doesn't necessarily mean that another person would be the vice president. Okay, so <clears throat> we also have um, an important argument here. Let me just check something. Uh, and that is this idea that if the moon is made of green cheese, then Janet Jackson is president. The moon is made of green cheese, so Janet Jackson is president. Now, this one actually does fit into one of the types of arguments we looked at in 1.3. You might reflect on that. The key word here in this argument would be this first one here, if. right? And when an argument uh, has an if-then statement as one of the premises, uh, at least one of the premises is the conditional statement, in other words, uh, then we would say it is a hypothetical syllogism. And that's what this is. Now, thinking about this argument, it's obviously very strange. Um, there's a lot of uh, falsehoods in here that I think we can quickly recognize. But at the same time, a lot of people tend to think, well, there is still something good about it. And so we'll come back to that thought here in a little bit. And finally, if I told you that some, of, some politicians are rich and some of the people in this room are rich, thus someone in this room has to be a politician, uh, here again, I think people think about this a little bit. And if we imagine, say, a typical class uh, room on the Everett Community College campus, uh, I think people would think, yeah, there's something not quite right about this and, and inclined, would be inclined to describe this as a bad argument. And that would be a, a good reaction to have, I think. So we'll come back to these arguments. Uh, but I want to, first of all, talk to you about um, some terminology here, uh, specifically uh, deductive arguments and uh, asking whether or not those deductive arguments are valid or invalid. So when you know that you're dealing with a deductive argument, you want to ask this question first. If I assume, right, and assuming is, we could say in a sense pretending, that the premise or the premises are all true, does the conclusion necessarily have to follow 
Um, that is, is it guaranteed uh, as the author suggests it does, right? So we'll remember here uh, what we learned in 1.3, and that is what makes something a deductive argument uh, is the fact that the author of that argument thinks the conclusion is guaranteed by the premise or premises. Now, in reality, of course, sometimes the author makes a mistake. They think the conclusion is guaranteed by the premises, but it really isn't. So going back to this question, to determine validity, we need to first of all pretend, assume, believe that all the premises are true. Whether or not they really are, we're just going to assume that they're true. And when we assume that they're true, we ask ourselves then, would they then guarantee that the conclusion is true? And if the answer to this question is yes, you can see that we would describe it as a valid argument. So when we assume the premises are true, and then the conclusion would follow from those premises necessarily, right, it would be guaranteed, then we would call it a, a valid argument. On the other hand, sometimes we assume the premises are true, but the, even so, the conclusion is not guaranteed to be true by those premises. And in that case, as you can see here, we call this a, an invalid argument. So you know, we have this sort of abstract idea of what validity is about or what it's dealing with here. But of course, what's going to be important is that we um, be able to apply it. And so we're going to take us back uh, to this previous slide here. So as we were talking earlier, right, this first uh, argument here uh, is something like a deductive argument. Um, and so we can ask, we'll go ahead and consider it as a deductive argument, is it valid or not? To do that, then we want to assume that all mammals have hair want to assume that Bobo, whatever Bobo is, is a mammal. If both of those things were true, would it then be guaranteed that Bobo has hair? And of course, I think we can recognize that the answer there is yes. And so when we say yes, drop that down a little bit. When we say yes, we're saying it is a valid argument, right? That is a valid argument. Write that down, make a note of it. OK, now, <clears throat> let's say uh, we're going to assume that Ross Perot was elected president. Would that guarantee, then, that Dan Quayle is vice president? And here, um, I think we can recognize that it wouldn't guarantee it, right? Even if Dan Quayle and Ross Perot were running on the same ticket and Ross Perot was elected president, would that guarantee that at this very moment in their uh, administration, Dan Quayle would still be alive and be vice president? It wouldn't, right? Perhaps Dan Quayle would have passed away two seconds before we were thinking about this uh, particular argument. And so since the conclusion here is not 100% guaranteed by the premise, uh, we then would have to call it invalid. All right, here, next one about Janet Jackson here. Uh, it's a very important example, actually, so please be sure you understand uh, the thought process here and, and do contact me in one way or the other if, if you're struggling with that. So here's the idea. We're going to determine if this argument, which we know is a hypothetical syllogism, is valid or invalid. So we're going to assume somehow that if the moon is made of green cheese, then Janet Jackson is president. We're going to assume that somehow that's true. We're also going to assume it's true that the moon is made of green cheese. Now, if both of those things are presumed to be true, would it then be guaranteed that Janet Jackson is president? Well, yes. I mean, it's a strange set of circumstances. But if those premises were true, the conclusion would, in fact, be guaranteed, meaning that this argument is valid. Now, we'll remember that. I'm going to come back to this later in today's uh, presentation uh, because at the same time, we're going to recognize that number three here about Janet Jackson is clearly nothing but falsehoods. But as we've just recognized, right, this is a valid argument. All right, and we have one more here. And so, uh, again, we're going to start with assuming it's a deductive argument, and it's very close, again, to a categorical syllogism, by the way. Uh, and so we will assume that some politicians are rich, and I think that's an easy enough assumption to make. Let's also assume that some of the people in this room are rich. If both of those statements were true, would it then be guaranteed that someone in this room has to be a politician? I think we can recognize that it wouldn't be guaranteed. It would be 
possible, but it would not be guaranteed. And so if the conclusion is not guaranteed by the premises, if they're assumed to be true, then we're saying that this argument is invalid. Right? So we get valid, invalid, valid, and invalid. All right. Now, we just talked about deductive arguments and how to determine if they're valid or invalid. We'll practice this some more in just a few minutes. But we can then, we just went back to the previous arguments, we can then ask uh, about the next level of evaluation with regard to deductive arguments, and that is to ask whether or not they are sound or unsound. So if an argument has already been determined to be invalid, it is automatically unsound. Okay? So I want to uh, emphasize that when we know something is invalid, like this one, it is automatically unsound. We don't have to think about anything here. It's just an automatic determination. Let me just fix this a little bit. Okay. Maybe that works a little better. Okay, the same thing here. It was invalid, so it's automatically unsound. Now, if the argument has already been determined to be valid, as we saw in a couple instances here, it could either be sound or unsound. And so this is where we have to think a little bit. A deductive argument will be sound if it is valid and all of its premises are true, that is, true in reality. In other words, at this level of evaluation, we're no longer going to assume that anything is true. We are now going to ask, is it really true? And if we have a valid deductive argument, it will be unsound if one or more of the premises is false. Right? And so what we'll do here is we'll go back to those previous arguments. And so again, we have all mammals, here it is, all mammals have hair, Bobo is a mammal, thus Bobo has hair, and I think we agreed that that was a valid argument here. Okay. So if it's valid, we have some further thinking to do. In other words, it may be sound, it may be unsound, and what makes that determination will be, are all the premises actually true in reality? So our first premise, all mammals have hair. Do, in fact, all mammals have hair? And I will tell you, as you're thinking about this, uh, if you're unsure, uh, I want to, uh, assure you that you're not alone in that. Um, in fact, there has been controversy about this to some extent, um, and it took me a, a while to actually finally go out and contact a biology instructor who assured me that in fact, not every mammal has hair. Dolphins, whales are the prime candidates here. They don't have hair. Um, evolutionarily speaking, they sort of have the, the remnants of where hair might have been when before they evolved into dolphins and whales, but they don't actually have hair. And so, in fact, because it's not true that all mammals have hair, um, the, f the first premise is false. We would say that that argument is unsound. Now, I'll just say, though, let's just for a second stipulate that all mammals had hair, right? So, in other words, let's perhaps go into the future when all of the dolphins and the whales and these creatures are now extinct. It's a sad thought, right? But let's just say that were the case. Would it now be sound or unsound? We could ask that question. So in other words, we're going to say, yes, at this point in history, all mammals do have hair. Would not yet be able to say if it's sound or unsound because we'd have to ask, does Bobo, in fact, uh, it, sorry, is Bobo a mammal? And so is Bobo a mammal? Well, if you're looking around and not sure, that's the right uh, response to have. Because what I would have to do is, of course, bring Bobo in to, say, the room and say, aha, here's Bobo, right? And if Bobo turned out to be an iguana, then this argument would be unsound. On the other hand, if Bobo turned out to be a chimpanzee, uh, then it would be true that Bobo is a mammal. We've already stipulated that, let's say, in the future, all mammals have hair. And in that case, this would end up being a sound argument. Of course, given the real world today, as we've said, it is unsound. Okay, so the second one about Ross Perot and Dan Quayle, automatically unsound, we don't have to think about it. The third argument, food is made of green cheese and so forth. Well, remember, we already said it was valid, so we'll remember that. But this is important, right? I think many of us, when we read that or saw that argument initially, thought there's something very screwed up about this. And of course, we can now recognize that what is screwed up about it is not that it's invalid, because we know it is valid, but what's messed up about it, of course, is that the fact that uh, both premises in this case are false. 
And so it is very clearly an unsound deductive argument. And then finally, we have uh, this last one about politicians. It's invalid, and so it is, of course, automatically unsound. We don't have to think about it, right? So you can know here, for, for example, if this last uh, problem were on the exam that you're going to get on this material, um, if during the exam a student came up to me and said, um, you know, I'm thinking about this one and I'm trying to figure out, uh, it, you know, if this second premise here about the people in this room are the rich, if somebody were asked me about that, the truth value of that second premise, I would know that they've kind of been led astray somehow in, in evaluating this argument. Because we don't need to know if anybody in the room is rich. Uh, we know that it's unsound automatically because it's invalid. Right? Finally, um, I'll also say here, if you're a little bit worried about whether or not you're going to know whether or not, for example, all mammals have hair, right, which was essential for determining the soundness here, um, I want to assure you that on the practice exam that you'll be able to download uh, to prepare you for the first exam, at the end of that practice exam, I will have a list of all the facts you'll need to know uh, to determine if the arguments are, are sound or unsound. 